Hello and welcome to another TLDR UK video. After lockdown, restrictions began to loosen over summer and life began to return to some semblance of normality. Understandably, many people are now concerned about the talk of second lockdowns. But in recent weeks, the science and the spread of the virus has changed significantly and it does seem that the government and their medical advisors are taking this shift seriously. Which begs the question, will we need a second lockdown anytime soon? Before we answer that question though, a quick shout out to everyone who's been backing us on Patreon. These backers help us make more content across the TLDR network and support the work we're doing. In return, they get bonus perks like exclusive live events, behind the scenes posts, early access to videos, merch discounts, exclusive merch items, and their names mentioned in videos. Hey Jonathan Crayler. Find out what you can get over on our Patreon page, it's linked down below. I think it's important to start this video with some context and by debunking some myths, because I think in recent weeks it's not just COVID that's been spreading. So let's start with the graph that I've been showing anyone who will listen over recent days, the rate of new cases in the UK. While it might be easy to feel like the worst days of COVID are now behind us and that the first national lockdown solved all of our problems, we're now seeing case numbers which almost match the first wave of COVID. With a surge like this underway, it's clear that thinking we're out of the woods is a little more than just wishful thinking. Also, it's worth remembering that viruses like COVID aren't additive, they're multiplicative. Now, this is where the R rate comes back in. Remember the R number? It was first discussed in that speech that Johnson gave, which included a whole bunch of fancy scales and graphics, which were dropped pretty much immediately. Whatever happened to that Nando's looking little dude? Anyway, the point is that the R rate is the number of people that each infected person passes the virus onto. Anything less than one is good because it means that each infected person is passing it on to less than one person, and thus the virus is in retreat. However, if it's more than one, you can expect to see cases rise once again. Unfortunately for Britain, it's expected that the R rate could be as high as 1.4 and much higher in specific areas. Nationally, it's still lower than the virus's peak, but this could rise further in the future. So with cases rising sharply, it's not crazy to expect cases to ramp up even further in the coming days. Which brings us to the press conference yesterday by Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer, and Patrick Valance, the Chief Scientific Advisor. During this presentation, which notably didn't include Johnson or any other political figure, Whitty and Valance outline the current situation with the virus and what can be expected in the coming weeks. As Sir Valance's slides illustrated, if the virus's spread were to continue at this rate, the current spike could become incredibly serious. Valance was very keen to note that this isn't expected or a predicted outcome, but it does represent a real possibility and outlines how the virus's spread could impact the whole country. Before we dive deeper into future plans, it's worth covering a few other popular beliefs and theories which were discussed in the press conference. Firstly, some people argue that this spike isn't as serious as the government claims, primarily arguing that it's okay because young people are leading this surge in cases. Now, this is broadly accurate, though it's becoming less true as other age gaps begin to see cases rise rapidly too. Ultimately though, the virus doesn't care about demographics or age groups, and people don't purely meet up with people who happen to fall into these neat age categories. We will, and already are, seeing growth across all groups as younger people begin to mingle with people of all ages, at family gatherings, at work, and in shops and restaurants. When it was primarily 20 to 29 year olds causing this spike, it allowed hospitalizations and death rates to stay low. As we've known pretty much from the beginning, older people and those with pre-existing conditions are by far the most vulnerable to COVID, with young people broadly unimpacted. This means that when cases spike in this demographic, they're likely to recover without any hospitalization. Crucially though, this doesn't mean that the virus has changed or that low deaths will continue forever, as demographic shifts and time lags catch up. As the virus spreads between generations, we will invariably see hospitalizations and deaths begin to rise alongside the cases. And this isn't just speculation either. Looking at countries across Europe allows us to see how serious the impact can be as cases rise, and that higher cases do indeed lead to greater numbers of hospitalizations and deaths in the longer term. 
We've seen increased in cases across Europe, and here I've taken examples of Spain and France. We've seen an increase in the numbers of cases. It started with younger people in their 20s and spread gradually to older ages as well. That increase in case number has translated into an increase in hospitalizations. As you look at the slide on the right here, you will see that very sadly, but not unexpectedly, deaths are also increasing. So there's a simple message from this slide, which is that as the disease spreads, those increase in hospitalizations will lead to an increase in deaths. Notably though, these stats don't show the full extent of the crisis in Spain and France. With graphs not extending to today, they miss out more recent cases, which see both countries experiencing more cases than they even had at the peak of the crisis. Britain may be lagging behind these spikes, but it's a real warning of what could be to come. Another common misconception is that increased testing has led to increased numbers of cases being found, something that the experts took special time to debunk. Could that increase be due to increased testing? The answer is no. We see an increase in positivity of the test done, so we see the proportion of people testing positive has increased even if testing stays flat. I touched on this briefly a moment ago, but it is worth emphasising that the virus broadly hasn't changed. We have got better at treating the virus in some ways, which could limit the number of deaths. But fundamentally, this is the same virus, with the same damaging potential that we've been fighting all year. The issue is that while we get better at handling the virus in some ways, we're still heading into the hardest time for fighting the virus, winter. Not only are viruses like COVID more able to spread during the winter, think of the standard cold and flu season, but we also face major issues in hospitals. In a standard winter, capacity at hospitals tends to hover around 95%. Due to COVID preparedness projects, many hospitals do have additional capacity this year. But regardless, it's clear that it wouldn't take too many hospitalizations to push the NHS past capacity. And that's why the advisors have made clear that we could face multiple challenges at once, not only deaths from COVID, but also problems related to hospitals reaching capacity. Is that there are, as we've said from the beginning, four ways in which this virus is going to have significant effect on the population's health. The first is direct COVID deaths, people who get the virus and die of the virus. The second would be if the NHS emergency services uh, were overwhelmed by a huge spike, and that is what the extraordinary efforts of the population uh, allowed to prevent happening in the first wave we met. The third, however, is very important, which is if the NHS is having to spend a large proportion of its effort uh, in trying to treat COVID cases, it will lead to a reduction in treatment for other areas, in di early diagnosis of disease, uh, and in prevention programmes. So there is an indirect effect on deaths and on illness from this impact on the NHS if we allow the numbers to rise too fast. This is clearly a stark warning. So even if you do think the risk of COVID is overhyped, this is still a worrying issue. With so little spare capacity in a standard winter, even small spikes could make a big difference, even to those who don't have COVID. And that's not to say that lockdowns and restrictions don't have risks, with them going on to explain those too. We also know that some of the things we've had to do are going to cause significant problems in the economy, big social impacts, impacts on mental health. If we do too little, this virus will go out of control and we will get significant numbers of increased direct and indirect deaths. But if we go too far the other way, uh, then we can cause damage to the economy, which can feed through to unemployment, to poverty, uh, to deprivation, all of which have long-term health effects. Regardless, it's very likely that the government could be considering some more drastic action. It's clear from current data, projections and the experiences of other comparable countries that the UK is headed down a risky path and that not acting now could spell trouble in the future. So those are the core arguments for stricter measures. Firstly, this isn't just impacting young people anymore. Secondly, while deaths haven't been rising so far, as the virus spreads to older groups, we can expect deaths to follow, just as they did in France and Spain. Thirdly, the virus is just as deadly as ever, and we're not that much better at fighting it than we were before. And fourthly, there genuinely are more cases. It's not just that tests are helping us find more of them.
We don't yet know how the government will react to this challenge, whether they'll take small steps or institute a full national lockdown once again. But it's pretty clear that they have to do something. And that's actually pretty well illustrated by yesterday's presentation. Call me an armchair political analyst, and well, that's kind of my job. But sending out two of the UK's top advisers without a politician certainly looks like they're laying the groundwork for major changes. The message from the press conference is clear. Objective, apolitical experts think that things are getting worse and that action is needed. This gets the ball rolling before politicians even come into it. It gets the conversation going about the severity of the issue and allows the government to swoop in and make the changes they need to implement. Right now, we don't know what those next steps will be or how far the government will go. Some seem to be proposing relatively light touch new rules, like new curfews or some limitations to the hospitality industry, something that Johnson's set to announce in the Commons later today. Others are proposing a two-week national lockdown to try and limit the spread enough to prevent an NHS meltdown over winter without destroying businesses at the same time. When we're speculating about the next step, one message came through pretty clear from the advisers when Witty commented on the need for everyone to take action. A lot of people say, well, can't people just be allowed to take their own risk? The problem with a pandemic or an epidemic is if I as an individual increase my risk, I increase the risk to everyone around me and then everyone who's a contact to theirs. And sooner or later, the chain will meet people who are vulnerable or elderly. So you cannot, in an epidemic, just take your own risk. Unfortunately, you're taking a risk on behalf of everybody else. It's important that uh, we see this as something we have to do collectively. While it's ultimately up to the government, this does seem as though officials are already defending and advocating for lockdowns. So we ought to keep an eye on announcements in the next few days. After all, when my actual holiday was cancelled this year, I booked a short trip away in the UK for next week. And with these impending announcements, I probably won't pack my bags just yet. What do you think of these announcements? Do you think that the government should be locking down hard to prevent the spread of the virus? Or should they be more careful in order to prevent damage to businesses and the economy? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos like that guy GW, John McDonald and Jose Plans, then be sure to back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.